CBE update. Today is Thursday, April 30th, uh, last day of April. It's been quite the month. Uh, and with us today, we have staff from the Minnesota Department of Education, Literacy Action Network, and the Minnesota Adult Basic Education Distance Learning Team. Welcome. It's good to see everyone, at least virtually. Joining us today, we have various staff from the Minnesota Department of Education, and they'll introduce themselves as we get into each section. My name is Brad Haskamp. I'm the Adult Secondary Credential and Education Policy Specialist with our team, and you can see all the other presenters that we'll have with us today. We are going to ask you to please hold your questions until the end of the section or its session uh, when we get to questions. Uh, the reason for that is we have a lot of content today and we want to make sure we're able to get through it all um, before we get um, into some detailed questions. When we get to the question and answer period, please you can always type your questions in using the webinar's chat function or you can click to raise your hand and then we'll unmute you and you can ask your question over the phone or headset during those Q&A periods. Also, if you're having any technical assistance needs or questions, you can uh, chat with Carla Vian with Literacy Action Network. And we're really happy to have Carla joining us today as our technical assistant. Uh, thank you so much, Carla. Good to see you. Today, we're gonna cover quite a few topics. We have some key messages and updates. We'll talk about policy and testing, high school equivalency, distance learning, adult basic education grants, funding, and hours, then IELCE, IET, transitions and partner updates, and we'll end with resources, professional development, and then questions. Okay, so let's launch right into it. It's important to know that uh, all the resources from this webinar um, and our earlier communications on COVID-19 can be found online at mnabe.org. You can see the link there to our specific ABE presentations. I also want you to note that we have quite a few materials in the, se um, in the session for today if you click on the materials tab, and that includes a PDF of all of the slides for today. So let's turn it over to Todd to share some key messages with us. Todd. Thanks, Brad. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for uh, joining us for this update this morning. Um, first of all, I want to just start as we have with every other webinar by um, just wanting to share with all of you how amazed uh, and hugely impressed all of us are who work at the on the state um, ABE team with the um, innovative work, the you know incredibly quick uh, adapting to the situation once we went to a close down, uh, to all the great and innovative ideas folks are doing in providing instruction at a distance and keeping in contact with students. Um, it's really been an amazing thing to watch and be part of. And so just want to acknowledge that, um, um, to say thank you for all that great work and to really uh, acknowledge just how amazing uh, it has been. So thank you. Next slide, Brad. At this point, I think I'm gonna turn it over to Jody, um, who's gonna share a little bit of the, some of those innovations and updates we've seen, Jody. Thanks, Brad uh, and Todd. So um, I want to take just a moment. We wanted to share with you all just some images of what ABE looks like um, across our state right now. Um, and a big thank you to all of you who responded to my kind of last minute request to share some images. Um, so we know there's a lot of instruction going on via um, video and video conferencing. So this is Kylie in Moorhead. Keep going, Brad. Um, there's uh, grammar lessons happening um, on video that teachers are recording and students are watching. This is Paulina in Blaine. There, uh, this is an example of a fractions lesson. This was a video made with Screencastify and this is um, Laura teaching her students in Brainerd. 
Uh, here's another math example. It looks like some algebra work that's happening um, on an online platform. This is Amber working with her students at Anoka Ramsey College. And you will note, if you look carefully, Amber is outside in that photo. Um, the next image is a project um, by an ABE student who is working on completing their adult diploma. Um, this image was from Paula, a teacher in Osseo. Um, we know that there are um, courses that are happening online, ABE courses. Um, Neighborhood House has a couple of examples. This is an English and GED course with teacher Kaya. And this one is a math course with uh, John. And we also know that even um, some career pathway work is still happening um, using online platforms. So this is an example of a Google Classroom. Uh, this is an intro to small business course that's just getting underway um, through the Hub Center in St. Paul. And this is an example of how one of our biggest AB providers, the Department of Corrections, um, is adapting. So this is the staff at the Correctional Facility in Stillwater, and they are preparing packets um, to be distributed to their learners who are you know, no longer able to come to the classroom, but are being given the um, work to do in their own spaces. And we know that, you know, students are engaging with us using um, using tools to work at a distance. So this is from teacher Nikki, um, who teaches at one of the Literacy Minnesota Open Door Learning Centers. Um, and she put out a video to her students. And this is a student response um, who just noted my reaction to the video was of hope for our countries to recover from COVID-19. We also know that some students are not able to use um, computers and online technology to engage right now. And here's an example of a student who um, is doing paper and pencil work. So um, this student responded um, to a reading by answering the questions um, on paper. Um, this is a student from, uh, or an image from Jen in Columbia Heights. And we know that there is a lot of innovation going around um, of how to reach out and connect with students. We know that's been a challenge. Uh, here's an example of uh, using WhatsApp. So um, Chris teaches in St. Paul at the Hub Center and used WhatsApp to reach out to students that they hadn't heard from yet. And you'll note uh, the student responds and says, hello, no computer. So we know that that is very much a reality um, that you are all are facing right now. And lastly, I wanted to share this image. Um, this came from Erin, who teaches at Lindell Neighborhood Association in South Minneapolis, who shared a story that um, they have a student who is currently undergoing chemotherapy. And that student, as she is at home, is making masks. And so the student had her husband, who is also a student, bring a set of masks to Erin and her family. Um, and so I, I really feel like this image represents the fact that, um, you know, we know and recognize that students have very big concerns on their mind right now, as do we as staff. And sometimes those concerns are more weighty and bigger than um, ABE instruction. However, we are all still, um, this shows how we are all still connected as community members in this time. So I'm gonna, with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Todd. Thank you, Jody. Thank you all for um, sharing those uh, amazing images and for all that interesting work. Jody, thank you for uh, putting that collection together and, and sharing those, um, those images with us. And so I guess following on that, um, again, another thing that we have done, I think, in each of the webinars that we've done is um, we just want to acknowledge um, that I think that we have found uh, and, and we are sure that all of you are finding that uh, making this transition has been a lot of work 
Uh, and people are doing that with lots of other constraints uh, in their lives. We've got uh, kids not going to school, people have disruptions in um, their work. Um, so uh, it's been fantastic, the number of students that have been able to continue uh, their learning during this shutdown. And um, again, amazing all the work that ABE staff have done but we also just want to acknowledge that one thing we are certainly trying to do as a, a staff and hope um, all of you are able to do this too, which is to just um, sometimes take a little time, take a deep breath, be sure and take care of yourselves and be sure and take care of each other. Uh, next slide, Brad. Um, so um, just wanted to note that um, we have a couple pieces of guidance went out from our office um, this week. And um, those you can find in the, they're both in the materials section um, on the webinar, and you can also find them on our website at that address Brad had noted earlier. As you all know, uh, the governor has extended the school, school closure uh, for the remainder of the school year. And so our interpretation is that um, what that means for adult basic ed programming is essentially um, at least through June 1st. And of course, there's variation uh, district by district on when school actually ends. Uh, but it, we're thinking at this point, it uh, looks like we will be uh, working remotely um, at least through uh, June 1st or until June 1st, although uh, things are developing quite rapidly. I think we're going to get another set of announcements um, today from the governor about how things will work moving forward. So uh, we'll stay tuned to that and we'll pass along that information uh, as we have it as well. Um, so net message from this one is I think with the exception of programming in correctional settings, um, programming in adult basic ed, uh, at least through um, June 1st will be at a distance. Next slide, Brad. Okay, a couple, um, I just have some kind of um, quick messages um, to share with you about questions that, that have um, been coming up. Uh, the first is people have been asking, what about reopening? What about access to buildings? Um, and right now, beyond um, beyond June 1st, I think it's still an unknown. Uh, we're going to have to uh, watch the announcements that the governor makes. Um, all of you will have to keep track of specific decisions that your districts uh, and employers make with regard to, because um, ultimately, um, you know, it, ultimately there'll be local decisions made about exactly what it means to comply with the directive. Um, and folks will need to comply with whatever decisions are made locally. Um, one thing we can share with you is that uh, just yesterday, the commissioner did allow two kinds of K-12 activities um, to start occurring uh, in person uh, in schools, um, starting immediately. Um, both are related to one is related to testing that can't be done remotely. The second is related to um, completing coursework that also cannot be done remotely. Um, we think that GED testing would fit that criteria as well. And so a request has been put forward uh, to add GED testing to that list of um, permitted uses. And we will keep, we have not gotten a reaction to that yet, but we will keep you posted uh, when we learn anything. Uh, second question we've gotten from a few folks has to do with, as you know, that when the governor and the commissioner made their announcement about continued school closing through the, or continued distance ed uh, with schools not open uh, physically um, through the end of the school year, they announced that May 1st uh, tomorrow and May, 1st, May 4th Monday would be days exclusively for planning for the remainder of the um, distance learning period. 
Uh, so relative to adult basic education, the governor's order does not explicitly prohibit AB instruction on those days. Uh, and we know that um, we have a reduced uh, number of students participating in adult basic ed, uh, but we also have lots of staff then who are also have some time freed up and are working on building capacity uh, and supporting folks who are doing actual distance learning instruction. So I think it's our take that it would seem that ABE programs have the capacity to both plan for continued distance learning on those days uh, and also provide services. Having said that though, ultimately it's really your local district or local organization that makes decisions about it, what it means to comply with the governor's directive. And so you really need ultimately to follow your local district organization guidance. Next slide, please, Ben. Quick legislative update. Um, folks have been, you know, sort of wondering uh, if there's anything in the works in legislation, um, really at the federal level, nothing particularly notable for adult basic ed. Uh, at the state level, one possibly uh, kind of um, fortunate event is uh, it looks like there is still language alive in an education bill that is working its way through the House and Senate that would um, actually end up in providing about a 3% increase uh, to adult basic education funding for next year for the 2021 program year and the way that language is written along with existing language and statute that would have the effect of of being uh, essentially a, a permanent increase of three percent so uh, we're hopeful that continues to stay in the bill and ultimately that that bill is signed and folks at literacy action network are certainly uh, tracking that and we'll be providing information to folks as it's available. And then last message from me um, has to do with, uh, we're all aware that following typical procedure uh, beginning tomorrow, May 1st, would be the start of a new contact hour counting year. That would be for counting contact hours for use in the AB formula that is used to allocate 2021-22 uh, funding. So those contact hours do not have an effect on the actual overall state appropriation, but through use in the formula, they do impact um, to one degree or another for every consortium in the state, how those how that state appropriation is allocated. Um, so we are well aware that given the disruption, it raises all sorts of questions about what the best way to proceed with counting contact hours for use in that 2021 formula, or excuse me, 22, 2122 formula is. And so we have entered in once again to a collaboration with Literacy Action Network. Uh, we'll be, we will be working together to facilitate a process whereby AB stakeholders can come together, um, examine uh, the various factors and considerations related to conduct hours in the formula, and then make a recommendation to the M MD AB team uh, about how to proceed um, relative to that. Uh, contact hours for the 2021 formula. Along with that, I'd also, and I guess, um, well, along with that, I'd also like um, to just note that regardless of what is decided, it is likely that May um, 2020 hours, so the hours over this next month, during which we know there will be closure, will not be used in the formula. Uh, for allocating funds for the 2022 program year or fiscal year. So, um, related, I guess, um, Susan, I'm going to ask if um, if you wanted to um, note anything about LANS collaboration with um, 
adult basic ed or with the MD ABE team on the um, putting together a, a working group? Uh, sure. Thanks, Todd. Um, we're just in the planning stages of this right now, so we don't have a lot of uh, details to release yet. But Todd and I had a really productive conversation earlier this week, and um, we're going to be putting together a team of Department of Ed and Literacy Action Network staff to plan um, a working group that would meet several times to gather input from ABE managers across the state to figure out what um, the best process and um, and scenario would be for everyone regarding uh, the contact hour reporting period for um, for 21-22. So um, watch for a call coming out from LAN um, for folks to um, participate in um, in that working group and or um, the working group will be, you know, a fairly small number of people, but then we will also um, hopefully be able to survey everyone else as well. So keep um, keep your eyes open for something coming out from LAN on that. Perfect. Susan, thank you very much. Uh, Brad, next slide, please. Okay, I think that turns it over to me. Thank you so much, Todd. Thank you, Susan. Um, and I'm going to talk uh, first about um, some policy and testing issues, and the first item with that is about our uh, announcement yesterday about 12 plus hours or the 12 hour restriction. So starting tomorrow, our office, the Adult Education Office at NDE, is lifting the 12 hour restriction instead for new students with no po uh, with no pretest during the school closure period. Um, to do that, you'll need to enter COVID EFL exception in the student's assessment tab in order to generate 12 plus hours or enter 12 plus hours. Uh, these student uh, hours will count for AB funding, but they might not count for federal AB funding. Um, and we uh, did send an email through Sherry yesterday about that announcement. So I know a lot of you are extremely happy and relieved about that. So let's just talk through a little bit of how to make that happen in SID. So first off, you need to make sure that in your assessments for you as a SID user that enters test scores, you need to make sure that COVID EFL exception is one of your testing options like TABE or CASAs. Um, so if you start by selecting your display test, then you go down and you wanna make sure you check the COVID-19 um, EFL exception. And, uh, and you, uh, you just need to do this one time only. You don't need to do this every time you enter this. Then when you go to your, um, find your students that do not have a valid pretest, you find those, you go to their assessment tab, you select the COVID exception, uh, EFL exception in, their, in that student's assessment tab, and you enter a score of one. Uh, and then at that point, you can enter 12 plus hours. Please note that this will only be active for hours in May and beyond. You cannot you, um, retroactively enter April hours for that. This will only apply starting May 1, starting tomorrow. How long will this 12 hour restriction exemption last? Um, and the, the, some things that we're considering in our office as we look at lifting, as we look at when we would lift that um, exemption, one, we want to make sure that in-person A-B test, uh, testing can resume and or that remote testing options are approved and available for all A-B programs um, and students. So we want to look at those two factors as we move forward. Um, and we'll make sure that we give all of you at least one month notice uh, when reinstating that restriction again. So if you have more questions, um, have uh, need some additional details. There is a wonderful SID help article that uh, Mary Zimmerly and Jenny uh, developed that can be found at this link um, for the SID help article. You can also email if that if you still have questions after reading that article, you can uh, email the SID support staff. Or if you have additional questions about the policy aspect, you can uh, let me know, and I'll be happy to answer your questions. So let's start talking about those remote NRS testing options. I will. I, I do want to say right off that our office 
does approve remote NRS testing for AB programs as long as it adheres to requirements set by test vendors and by the U.S. Department of Education. So let's talk about what is and is not currently available and when things might be available. So the best plus is currently available for remote testing. And this means that computer-based testing can happen where you are on your computer at your home or office and the student is testing on their computer or device at their location. And so it is computer-based testing. To get to hear more about that, you can contact Linda Keller, State Assessment Trainer with Metro North ABE for more information. Although we do know that Best Plus is primarily only used by Metro North at this point in the state of Minnesota. CASAs, they are making remote e-testing available via Zoom sometime here in May. And they um, and this will be prioritized to programs that already have CASAs e-testing underway or are, and are trained in CASAs e-testing. Um, they're not initially making that available to programs that have not been doing e-testing or that are not trained in e-testing. TABE, this one is a new, this is brand new information. They, as of yesterday, announced that computer-based TABE 1112 is now available via web conferencing for TABE test administrators. One thing you need to know about TABE testing um, is that you need to have a DRC Insight account. And you can create a DRC Insight account by going to tabetest.com and uh, finding more information there. They also have unlocked their computer-based tape locator to be given remotely. And so you can do that with your students that have devices. You can give the students the locator for free uh, as long as you at your program have a DRC Insight account or you can create a DRC Insight account. Uh, there is providing be uh, training being provided by DRC and that started on Monday. One thing to keep in mind is DRC, if you go to tabetest.com, they do have remote proctoring guidelines um, for uh, local programs and for students. We do, uh, you do want to check tabetest.com and download that guidance and read through that guidance carefully. We will be sending more information about these options as well. Uh, our state assessment trainers, Marty Olson and Linda Keller, are writing an article that will appear um, not next week, but the week after in the PD newsletter. And we also plan on doing some uh, webinar training about those remote testing options uh, sometime here in the first half of May. So stay tuned for that. Let's also then move on to high school equivalency. So we do know right now the status of Minnesota GED testing is that GED testing centers are closed across the state. And that is due to the governor's stay at home order. And while businesses that work face to face with clients are, are closed. Um, so that is um, what many local programs have done and that has been our guidance um, through this process uh, because that is uh, in, in adhering to the governor's order, executive orders. We are though exploring some future GED testing options. First, remote computer testing. Again, this would be where a student is at home on a computer and they are testing and being remotely proctored by someone else. Um, this option will likely be available uh, potentially as early as the third week in May. Um, that would be the earliest that that is an, uh, available. Uh, they w would open this up to various states that um, are allowing this option. We in Minnesota have said that we would allow this to um, occur. We would like to participate in this pilot. Those that would receive top priority or the initial group to pilot this would be those that have canceled tests, those with one test left, and or those that are GED ready testing gr in the green zone, meaning they are likely to pass. Um, the next priority would be for those at the state level that we would consider priorities. Some uh, priorities that we have uh, identified include job offers, uh, military enlistment, court ordered, um, but we're also looking to hear from uh, those of you about other needs that you might hear about GED testing. And then it would open up to um, others. The proctors for this are not from our local GED testing centers necessarily. They are actually hired by OnView. Uh, they have not yet hired their proctors, 
uh, but they will be hiring proctors from Onview. They're just not sure how many yet that they're going to be hiring. Um, but as soon as that information is available, they have said that they would share that with me. And I would like to share that with all of you because you might have staff that would like to do um, some shifts with Onview to do remote GED proctoring. They do have two types of roles that they're hiring, greeters and actual test proctors. Other options that we're looking at include uh, testing in person with social distancing. And so we're going to be talking quite a bit about that um, and doing some plans about that starting tomorrow. Uh, and we're looking at other paper testing options. Please note though that paper testing would not be like the 2002 GED series. This would be where you actually schedule an individual for testing 10 days in advance. And then they would, um, and then you would get that test specific, or that test would specifically be printed for that individual, would be couriered to your site, that's what would need to take the test within a couple of days, and then you would need to courier that back to the scoring uh, site so that they could score it and then enter that score into the GED.com system. Um, we're looking at this option potentially in some correctional settings where that might be available. Tomorrow on Friday, we are meeting with staff with GED testing centers around the state of Minnesota. We did send an email invite out last week. If you did not receive that email invite or you don't can't remember if you received that email invite and would like to register for that, again, this is for staff that are actually working with GED testing centers, please email me, Brad Halfcamp, and I will be happy to send you that invite later today. Uh, but email me and I will be happy to send you that invite to the GED testing centers meeting. Then I, we also have had questions about GED ready proctoring. Many of you have seen this information, but there, um, but we are allowing people to do GED ready proctoring at a distance for age waiver purposes. The two primary ways that we will, that you could do this is you could train a, an adult that is on site like a parent to be the proctor, um, or you could actually remote proctor it through the computer or another device in the room where you can bid, um, watch the student take the test uh, to ensure that they do not cheat. Uh, we do prefer, prefer the remote proctoring option, but we understand both are valid options. But we do want to make sure that if you are training an adult on site to do this, that you need to train them. Well, how would you train them? There are a couple things that you need to make sure as a GED ready proctor that they are aware of. One, that the proctor must watch the tester complete the entire test. The proctor must also know what is and is not allowed during testing, such as can someone look at their phone? What devices can they have within, eye, um, within their eye shot? What are some other things that are or are not allowed during testing? They also, as a proctor, must verify that the tester did not use a device or resource that is not allowed during testing. They need to check that the student is not recording the test questions or responses, and they need to assure in general that the tester did not cheat um, to their best estimate. So those are the key criteria in terms of what a GED ready proctor needs to be able to do and that these elements should be embedded in your training if you are training an adult on site to be the proctor. Folks have also been wondering about the GED subsidy code. Um, because of the closure with COVID-19, the subsidy has not run out like we, into, like we anticipated in March um, or April. The, um, from July to March, we have used about 90% of the subsidy, and we have about we have just over $28,000 left in that subsidy. Um, the subsidy is currently approved through June 30th, and that subsidy is meant to be refilled again starting July 1 with another $250, uh, $245,000. Um, so stay tuned, but that sub, there is some remaining subsidy left when in-person testing um, resumes or potentially remote proctored testing um, as well. And I also wanted to let you know that uh, the high C's competition, our competition to see which tests or tests plural we will approve for high school equivalency purposes in the state of Minnesota, that is underway. We have a final version of the uh, competition materials and they are going to be posted here soon. We also have almost all of our official reviewers selected for this process. We're still waiting on, on one uh, person to get back to us. And then uh, we anticipate that the results for this uh, high school equivalency assessment uh, competition will be announced by July, and any transition period will likely be six months, 
six months to transition um, into, into any new tests or from any old tests, um, if that were to be the case. Um, but we likely could extend that six month period out even further. So stay tuned on this one, uh, more to come. So that is everything about testing, policy, and high school equivalency. I'm going to turn it over to Tom Citron Heisen and Susan Wetcamp Brandt to give us some distance learning updates. Tom, Susan? Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. We've been hard at work um, doing some things that we hope will make everyone's lives a bit better. So if we could proceed to the first slide. So we are um, quite aware that the, the current situation has led to a lot of requests around the state for some manner to approve um, teacher-created DL courses. And we've been working very hard with the ABE team at the state the last couple of weeks to develop a process, which we now have. Uh, and this will include procedures to approve both time on task and unit completion courses. Um, and there is in the um, policy addendum uh, some very specific descriptions and definitions of what a course entails. And basically, it's at least 12 online lessons, totally at least 20 hours, created by a teacher initially for their own use and later potentially for use by other ABE staff around the state. I think Susan will do the next couple of slides. Yep, please go ahead. So um, we have application forms on the distance learning website. And those application forms include um, a variety of details about your course. So what learning management system did you build it on? How are you um, going to do proxy or reporting? Uh, describe your course, what's in it? How does it align to standards? What kind of materials do you use? Is it for DL only? Is it hybrid? Um, those kinds of things. And then at the end, there's um, a a series of check boxes that the teacher um, selects that certify that the course um, meets ABE guidelines, and those are on the next page. And it sounds really serious, but it's actually really basic stuff. So let's take a look at that next slide. So um, you would fill out the form describing your course, and then you would certify that, yes, I'm the person who built this course. Yes, the course covers adult basic education content. It has both instruction and practice. Um, you verify that the learning management system is um, appropriate to the type that you're applying for. So it's either time on task or it's unit completion. And that you've spent a little time reviewing some guidelines around copyright and fair use and you're confident that the way you're using materials is um, allowable. So you, um, you certify those things and um, that form then comes to me and Tom and the rest of the distance learning team. And um, somebody on the team will read through your application. And if everything looks good, your course will be approved and you will be able to count proxy hours for that course. So let's go on to the next slide. So I think Tom is going to talk a little bit sure. about the process. So we have um, two stages to the process. The first begins when the teacher completes the online application for the course, whether it's time on task or unit completion. Um, our team, uh, distance learning support team, will review it to make sure it's complete. And if it is, then we would approve it for the teacher to use on a pilot basis. So at that point, only the teacher who has submitted the course can use it. After a pilot period, the teacher can apply to have it be um, available statewide. And the pilot period would be three months for time on task system courses or six months for unit completion. And the reason for the difference in that is that for the unit completion, we want to make sure that enough students have completed the course that the initial uh, number of proxy hours approved for time on task is accurate. Um, whereas three months on for time on task, um, we felt was adequate because it would allow the teacher to complete the entire course and check the quality of it. We would then um, consult with our entire team and uh, at that point approve the course for um, use statewide. And we are really at this point hoping and encouraging students to apply for this second stage of approval if they have piloted the course themselves and found it to be effective and instructionally sound. Because we would like to now be able to start expanding the pool of, of teacher created content and courses which is available um, throughout the state. 
go to the next slide. I think it'll bounce back to Susan. Right. So um, where can you find the forms um, and what do we have available for you? So those are on the distance learning website. They're um, under the resources tab and the section is state policies. So you'll see the new um, addendum regarding teacher created courses and then there'll be the two applications, one for time on task and one for unit completion. And then if you open up one of those applications in the introductory content on the application, you'll actually see two additional links for more information. So one is actually a link to um, a Google Docs version of the of the application form. So you can see all the questions laid out in one document and you don't have to submit page one before you can see the questions on page two. So it's good to kind of take a look through those questions before filling out the application so you know what you're going to need to get organized. And then the other link is to um, some kind of uh, guidance questions around, okay, how do I count the hours in SID? Um, does my course qualify? What do you mean by instruction? What do you mean by practice? Um, things like that that we anticipated getting some questions about. And um, if your question isn't answered on that document, you can contact us at the distance learning team. And if, um, if the questions are um, valuable to a larger group of people, we'll add them to that document in a sort of um, ongoing basis as things come in. Go ahead to the next slide. Um, and so we know this is obviously a really new process that uh, nobody, including us, has gone through before. So um, we're going to be doing a webinar training, or I should say I'm going to be doing a webinar training on Wednesday, May 13th um, from one o'clock to two o'clock. Um, and uh, we will walk through what the process looks like, what kinds of things should you be listing in these various questions, how do you write a, an application that can just get um, immediately approved, right? That's what we all want. We want people to be able to go out there, make their courses, reach their students, and get hours for it. So um, let's let's make that happen. Let's go through the training and, um, and we'll make sure everybody's on the same page. So um, I've submitted it to the Atlas calendar. I don't know if it's up on the calendar yet, but it should be soon. Um, and if you download these slides from the MNABE website, you'll see the link um, in the slides as well. And we will also be putting an article in the MNABE newsletter about this entire um, project. So you'll, you'll have the information right at your fingertips. Keep going. Good, to the next slide. I'm sorry, Susan. Go ahead. Nope. I just said thanks. Um, I also wanted to take a few minutes to thank um, some of the ABE educators who have been helping us shape this process um, by sending us their courses that they've developed, by pilot testing application forms, giving feedback, researching LMSs. Um, it's been a really um, wonderful experience working all of, with all of these folks. Amy Van Steenwick from Cedar Riverside Adult Education, Amber Deliger at Metro North Anoka R Ramsey Community College, Allison Wilcox from Metro South ABE, and Paula Fryermuth from Osseo ABE. Thank you all very much for your contributions. Our system and um, the applications and everything are much, much stronger because of your contributions. So I really appreciate all your help. Go ahead to the next slide. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Tom. Okay. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Jody Versat to give us some updates on AB grants, funding, and hours. Jody. All right. Thanks, Brad. And thanks, Tom and Susan, for those distance learning updates. Uh, I want to take some time to talk about funding and hours. First off, um, please note that Many, most of the due dates that we have for uh, funding activities and reporting have not changed. That includes the annual application, IELCE reports, and regional transitions plans. If any of those change, we will definitely let you know. And there is one change on the next slide. Um, so we have extended the deadline or the due date for the five-year narratives. Ordinarily, five-year narratives are due on June 1st. We have extended two months this year to August 1st. I have been in touch with all of you who are currently working on your narrative to submit. And I know many of you um, will be grateful for a couple of additional months. 
if you are scheduled to submit a narrative for your consortium in 2021, this affects you as well because you are sort of on deck to review the 2020 narratives this year. Originally, that would have happened in June, but now it will be happening in August. So please note that 2021 narrative folks. And also note, we will not be doing an in-person uh, review session this year, but we will do, uh, we will convene some webinars to do those group reviews. So uh, please be watching for more details from me uh, in email for anyone who is scheduled, any consortia that are scheduled to submit a narrative in 2021. Also want to remind you that the annual application is due on June 1st, as it always is. Those application materials are posted and are available on the MDE website. Uh, there's a couple ways to get more information and updates about the annual application. We do have a series of quick videos um, that are posted on our mnabe.org website. Um, and we will be doing a web chat next week, Wednesday on May 6th. That will give you more information about that application and you can register for that on the Atlas event calendar. The one thing to note that's new and different this year about the annual application is this additional table, table A1, and that is because of an adjusted contact hour reporting period. And I'm gonna um, continue talking more about that in the upcoming slides. So um, just to uh, be really clear to everyone um, about the time periods we are talking about when we refer to fiscal years and contact our reporting periods. So typically the way it works, the fiscal year is, uh, is July 1 to June 30th, and the contact hour reporting period typically is May 1st to April 30th. So typically what happens is the hours from that contact hour reporting period are used in the calculation of funding for the following fiscal year. For for example, hours from May 1st, 2018 to April 30th, 2019 were used in the calculation of funding for this current fiscal year, fiscal year 20, which started on July 1st, 2019 and is ending a couple of months from now. So we are making an adjustment to this for fiscal year 2021 because of COVID-19 and all the resulting disruptions and closures, the, the fiscal year will be starting as normal, obviously, on July 1st, 2020, and that goes through June 30th of 2021. But instead of using the regular contact hour reporting period, which would have been May 1st, 2019, through today, April 30th, 2020, we are adjusting that contact hour reporting period. We're essentially just shifting it back six weeks. So it will be March 14th, 2019 to March 13th, 2020. And I think the reasons we're doing that are clear, right? Because we know that these last six weeks, your programs, our programs have not been generating contact hours as they normally do because we haven't been able to do in-person ABE programs. We made this adjustment and we think that it's a good, important adjustment. However, anytime you make a change, there are sometimes unforeseen you know, consequences. So there's a couple little things that have happened that we need to sort of adjust for. So one of the things that we've realized is because we made this adjustment, what it means is that hours from March 14th to April 30th, 2019, so from this period a year ago, will essentially be counted twice. So those, hour, those hours already counted in the calculation for the current year, fiscal year 20 funding. And now because we shifted the time period back, that set of hours will be counted again for towards fiscal year 2021 funding. So if your consortium experienced some kind of significant decrease in hours due to a service disruption in that time period, specifically 
March to April of 2019, please let us know. We do, we've already heard from one consortium um, that this is the case. In that case, it was a correctional facility that was closed for education programming during that time period. And so that consortium already kind of suffered the consequences of that loss of hours uh, once in a funding calculation. And so they shouldn't have to have that loss of hours count against them twice. So we want to let you know if that is the case for anyone else out there, any other consortia, you, if you had a significant decrease in hours in March and April of 2019 due to some kind of service disruption, please uh, let our office know and we'll work through that with you. The second adjustment that we are having to make as a result of this change in the contact hour reporting period is we realize there's a little bit of an issue or there could be a little bit of an issue with distance learning proxy hours. We know sometimes uh, folks are entering those proxy hours in monthly totals in SID, which is generally speaking okay, especially if you have if there's only a few hours over the course of a month, it's okay to add them together for the entire month and enter that amount at the end of the month. If you did that for March of this year, for March of 2020, we need you to go back and split out those hours. So we need you to go back and determine the best you can in those distance learning platforms, which hours happened between March 1st and March 13th, and which hours happened after that. Then you need to go back and delete that original entry or edit that original entry and, and make sure that there are two entries instead of just one. So you need to have one entry for hours on or before the 13th of March and one entry after that. And please make sure that that happens before you run your final reporting in SID and fill in your tables for the annual application. So I want to take a few minutes to um, set a framework for what we should, what we can expect for ABE funding for the upcoming years. And the general message is here, um, there are many things for us to be stressed and worried and fearful about in this moment, but ABE funding actually isn't one of them. And so let me make that case for you. So um, we're going to look at uh, briefly at three fiscal years. So the current fiscal year that we're in is almost coming to an end. And the funding for that year correspond or was was divided up using contact hours from April 1st, 2018 to May 30th, 2019. The fiscal year that starts in a couple months on July 1st, remember we have adjusted the contact hour period that we're going to be using in the calculation for that fiscal year's aid. So we're shifting it back to March 14th, 2019 to March 13th, 2020. Then the fiscal year after that, so fiscal year 22, that will not start until July 1st, 2021. So that fiscal year is still more than a year away, but I know many of you are, um, are well aware of these time periods and you're aware that tomorrow, May 1st, would be, under regular circumstances, the beginning of the contact hour reporting period that we would use in calculating that funding. So we want you to what we want you to hear, as Todd and Susan have already pointed out, is that that we recognize things are not as usual, and we will be we will need to make some adjustments for how we count contact hours that we'll we'll use to calculate aid for 2022. So um, MDE and LAN will be working together to uh, engage a group of ABE stakeholders to make that decision together. So we don't have that answer for you yet, but what we can say is that likely the hours in May of this year will not be counted in that calculation. So um, another thing, another important thing to point out for these three fiscal years, the funding amount, and I'm just talking about state ABE funding here because that's the biggest pot of funding that we have. 
Our, the funding amount um, is secure. It's set in statute and nothing that's happening right now um, in terms of COVID-19 changes those amounts. So for the current fiscal year that we're in right now, that's almost done, we've got about 50 million uh, statewide of ABE aid. For next year, for fiscal year 2021, we will start, that's our baseline. That 50 million is the starting point. It is possible, as Todd mentioned earlier, that we may have uh, a 3% increase there. For the year after that, the baseline will be whatever the amount for fiscal year 2021 was. And it's possible there could be an additional increase that year as well. So I just want to point out that statewide, our system is not at risk of losing funding based on what's currently happening. So the important thing for you to hear or to know from this is that there is no direct relationship between the amount of contact hours and the amount of funding for our statewide system. Contact hours are what we use to divide up that statewide total between our consortia or our providers. And in general, when the total amount of hours go down statewide, the contact hour rate goes up and vice versa. If statewide hours go up, the contact hour rate usually goes down. So where we are right now, this current fiscal year, as I mentioned, we're almost to the end of it. Awards have been made. Those funds go through June 30th. Those awards will not change. As you all know, you can use that funding the way you're using it right now, which is paying staff for working from home, providing instruction to students at a distance. You can use it for professional development, for planning, for curriculum development, for capacity building. You can also use it to purchase devices, software, instructional materials. So the way that you've always used your funding with the exception of now, most of all the work is being done remotely. You can continue to use those funds in that way. Then, oh, oh, and one note about uh, this current fiscal year's funding. You should be asking yourself at this point in the year, are we going to spend all of our state and federal fiscal year 2020 award? If it's possible, you might have had some activities budgeted for that didn't happen this spring, right? Maybe maybe an event or maybe you were planning on starting a new class that didn't happen. So it's possible based on what's going on right now that may have some implications for your budget. If you have funds from fiscal year 20 that haven't been spent yet, you're not quite sure how to spend them, remember a couple of things. First, remember that federal ABE funds can't be spent past June 30th, so you've got just a couple of months to spend them up. Second, if you have state ABE funds, please note that up to 20% of those can be spent in what we call the fifth quarter, so between July 1st and September 30th. So as this slide suggests, you may want to be thinking strategically about if you've got funds, please use them and please use them to, um, to expand capacity for your students to be able to access online and distance learning. So a set of Chromebooks might be a really great idea. You also might wanna think about um, membership uh, or um, access to some different online distance learning platforms. Some of them are free, but we know many of them are not. Um, you may want to think about um, if you have staff who are available to put in more time, uh, paying someone to spend a little more time developing some curriculum for online instruction. So please be strategic and be thoughtful about how you use your funding and don't leave any of it on the table. We want all of that money to really benefit our ABE students across the state. Then when we're thinking about the upcoming years, so there's a new funding or a new fiscal year that'll start on July 1st. As we have said, the annual application for that funding is due on June 1st. Remember the total for our state ABE funding statewide will be similar to last year, about 50 million 
possibly another couple million because of a uh, legislation that might increase it a, a bit. And as we've said, we're using hours from March 2019 to March 2020 to divide up that total between consortia. As we look ahead past that to fiscal year 22, so remember that's the year that's going to start more than a year, a year and a couple months from now. Again, total statewide funding will start at the baseline of whatever we get for fiscal year 2021. It could bump up a little bit from there. And the big question we face at this point is what contact hour reporting period should we use to divide that up? So LAN and MDE and folks that are convened in a stakeholder group are going to be diligently working to answer that question so that um, a year from now, we know how to divide up that total. So um, short version of the messages are at this point, please continue to provide ABE instruction at a distance with as much access and quality as possible. Please continue to build staff and program capacity to serve your students at a distance and really don't worry about the funding. Or another kind of key message to, or another way to say this message is, we want you to continue doing what you're doing, which is provide all the instructional opportunities to your students in all the ways you can, regardless of whether or not you can count contact hours for those activities. We know contact hours will go down, but statewide funding won't. So originally we were giving you these key messages, really kind of focusing on the month of April, I think a month ago we thought, you know, maybe April will be hard, but then we'll be back to normal. Now we know that is not the case. So now we are saying this message to you for the longer term. Uh, looking ahead, at least for May, possibly beyond May, this is still the message. Please continue to do all of the wonderful and innovative things that we saw images of earlier. You know, count all of the can contact hours, um, for all of the things that count and do all of the other things that don't count for contact hours as well, because those are good and important. Um, Brad, you can go on to one more slide here. And this slide just has, you know, kind of some lists. We recognize some things count for hours and some of you are working and will be working through the process that Susan and Tom outlined to get additional things approved for hours. And all of that is great, but we recognize there are still things that you are doing right now that don't currently count for hours and it's okay and please keep doing all of those things so i'm going to turn it back to you brett thank Actually, you jody thank you very much yeah. that is very helpful at this point in time and an excellent reminder for us okay julie i'm going to turn it over to you to talk through a lot of our acronyms of the day ielce iet but also transitions and partners julie Thank you, Brad. Um, and good morning, everyone. I'd like to get started with a few updates. Integrated English Literacy and Civics Education Reminders. Just continue to work on as much of the work plan that you submitted as possible. I realize um, some of that plan you will not be able to implement. There will be a question on the year's final report regarding what changes and what impact did COVID-19 have on your programming and your work plan. And just so you know, I'll be reaching out to some of the grantees just to schedule a virtual check-in um, by the end of the fiscal year, June 30th. Next slide, please. Integrated education and training. Um, a reminder went out the last couple of weeks asking people to clean up the courses that have been listed as integrated education and training in, in SID. And several of you have done that. Thank you for doing that. And the ones that remain should be labeled uh, or tagged IET. If, it is, if you decided it isn't an IET, please untag that class. 
the next step in this is to complete an IET approval form. And those will be going out probably next week. And those forms are a description of your IET program. They also ask about a single set of learning objectives. Most IET programming across the state do not have a single set of learning objectives. And there will be training on how to do this, how to get started creating that. Um, and Astrid will uh, talk about that later in the PD section. But just so people are aware that there is uh, support provided for that. Next slide, please. For those of you that are currently part of a Pathways to Prosperity grant, um, these are the three grants, Pathways to Prosperity grants that are out there. Um, some of them, the funding in the grant can be extended, obviously not the 1819 ones, but just so you know that there is flexibility built, built into the Pathways um, grants. Next slide, please. Several of you have contacted me regarding um, P2P grants and um, some of the other programming. There is a frequently asked questions posted on the DEED website for all of the different programs. And you can access uh, those frequently asked questions at the link at the bottom of this slide. Um, they are allowing a lot of flexibility uh, with the grants currently. Next slide, please. Just so that you are aware, our Career Force services um, are still available. Whereas the Career Force centers are, most of them are shut down, they are providing services online and virtually. And here's a list of just different resources and services that are available. So if you can, please try to connect um, any students or learners that you know maybe are unemployed or are looking for work uh, to these different services. Uh, just so you know, there are still some employers that are hiring quite a uh, number of people or individuals. Next slide, please. The regional and local plans deadline has been extended essentially for a year. And um, this is the plan that needed to be submitted um, as part of WIOA by July 1st. So just so you know, the overall plan has been extended. However, if you could go to the next slide, please, Brad. Um, the memorandums of understanding in the infrastructure funding agreements have not been extended. And uh, they will need to be submitted. And there will be some changes to these documents. Um, the IFA uh, must indicate how all required one-stop partners and adult basic education is a required one-stop partner. Um, how we contribute to the one-stop infrastructure in a clear manner. Next slide, please. So the Department of Labor, the Federal Department of Labor did come and visit uh, Washington County here in Minnesota, and they did have some findings on what needed to be corrected across the state in regards to the MOUs and IFAs. Um, and the one thing they did indicate, which is good, I think, because it's the one thing we've really been pushing for in adult basic education is to really, um, describe that referral process between the different WIOA programs uh, better that, than we have done in the past. And this is an opportunity to build those, build and strengthen those um, relationships with our partners. Next slide, please. And just one more comment on, uh, this is a census. Overall, Minnesota is, the response rate is looking pretty good. And just so you know that there are 
uh, it, there is information translated into several different languages that's available for you to use, for you to download and distribute to students and learners uh, for completing the census. And the link is included there. And I think that's it. Next slide, Brad. Thank you very much, Julie. That is really helpful. Thank you for keeping track of everything that's going on with all of our important partners and making sure that we're uh, being a, not only being a good partner, but we're connecting our learners with the services as appropriate and keeping up with all the varying timelines, some of them changing, some of them not. Thank you, Julie. Mm -hmm. Okay, Astrid, I'm gonna open it up to you to share a little bit more about some resources and professional development. Yes, thanks, Brad. Uh, with so much going on, we wanna share with you um, a variety of different resources and training opportunities that are available to, to support you during this time. So let's go to the, the first slide, Brad. Just a reminder to everyone that we have sent, set up a central hub for all things related to COVID-19 and distance education. Um, so this is a place where you can go to check out a variety of resources that are being shared by your colleagues, um, a place to ask questions, network with others, um, really exciting things being posted there. I do wanna mention in relation to the census update that, that Julie gave us, there are some materials um, that you can use to um, support some instruction and get your students involved in the census posted on that Schoology website in the update section, so you can check that out. Um, so instructions on how to join here on the slide and you can download that. Um, from our materials page and you can also look on the atlas website in the covid19 resource section to find out more about the schoology group let's go to the next slide um, we've had excellent participation in a series of informal virtual coffee breaks that atlas and our other support network providers have been offering um, amazing ideas being shared um, in all of those coffee breaks We've been taking um, detailed notes based on the discussion and the chat log. So if you've missed any of those, you can head over to the Schoology group in the resources section and find the notes about what was discussed and resources that were shared. And then a variety of additional web chats are scheduled throughout the, the month of May. You can register on the Alice calendar and keep an eye out for additional ones being scheduled. We also have uh, a number of webinars. Uh, it seems like we've got something almost every day. Lots of opportunities to learn. Uh, the webinars do offer CEUs and we've tried to focus on some topics that address some of the relicensure areas. So hope that you'll join us for those. I do wanna draw your attention to uh, several of these that relate to distance education. Uh, next week, We'll have a panel of instructors talking about how they are maximizing their uh, synchronous time with students online on May 7th. So join us for that. And a number of webinars focused on distance learning platforms. So Moby Max also in the afternoon on May 7th, uh, May 18th, uh, Edmentum Courseware New and Refresher Training, and then later on May 21st, an opportunity to hear um, updates on what is new and approved in Minnesota in terms of distance learning platforms. Um, and then Julie did also talk about uh, the webinar that we'll be hosting focused on designing a single set of learning objectives for integrated education and training. So lots of great opportunities. Again, you can register on the Atlas calendar and get more information there. Go to the next slide and, and just a reminder if you miss any of these webinars you can always view the recorded webinar we've got a really robust uh, minnesota abe pd youtube channel so you can find recorded webinars as well as um, videos of classroom instruction so that's a, a great site to bookmark and visit frequently A reminder, final reminder here about our CCRS Instructional Leadership Summit that's coming up in just about a week. Um, this was um, initially planned as an in-person event, but we are holding it as a virtual conference. I believe that registration closes tomorrow. So all of you who are involved in any way with supporting your colleagues around 
CCRS implementation, uh, this is an excellent opportunity to learn about some new training materials and resources you can use in your program, get some tips on workshop and meeting facilitation, and network and collaborate with other CCRS leaders in the state. So we hope you'll join us for that. Um, and another announcement, if you have not seen this yet, um, the decision has been made to move our annual ABE Summer Institute online. Um, it will still be held uh, during the same week of August. Um, it will be two day, a two-day event on August 19th and 20th. The call for proposals has been extended to the end of May, um, and sessions will all be 45 minutes to um, fit better into that online format. So you can visit the Literacy Action Network website um, to get to that call for proposals, and then just keep an eye out on, in the ABE uh, PD Connect newsletter for more information about the conference. Also, just some, some reminders and some new resources focused on distance learning. I um, want to make sure that everybody knows about um, an event that our Minnesota ABE, Minnesota K-12, excuse me, colleagues have organized for tomorrow and Monday, which are the DL planning days, the Minnesota Distance Learning Summit. Um, this is a live virtual event. It's free. There are opportunities to participate live, to view recordings, as well as to participate in extended conversations around the topic. The schedule looks excellent, um, so hoping that some of you and your teachers will be able to participate and learn from and with our K-12 colleagues. Also, just a reminder that all things Minnesota ABE distance learning can be found on our distance learning website. Um, and it looks like that website did get cut off by the visual on this uh, slide. So that's um, MNABE distance learning dot. Somebody help me out. Is that com or org? Dot org. Thank you. Dot org, yep. Dot org, yep. And then nationally, um, lots of resources out there. There's a new Tips for Distance Learning website that's hosted by the EdTech Center at World Education that has some great information about getting up and running quickly. And they've been hosting weekly webinars on Friday afternoons um, that have just been excellent on distance education strategies. So you can participate in those live. You can also go back and review uh, the recorded webinars and notes. And then finally, um, our national links um, discussion forums uh, has an integrating technology discussion group that has been really active during this time. So if you're not already um, a member of links, you can go in and uh, get set up. It's free and um, subscribe to the integrating technology discussion group to hear what um, folks all around the country are doing in terms of um, integrating technology and moving to distance education. Just another reminder that now more than ever, really important to, to open that newsletter that's coming into your inbox every Tuesday. Um, we've got some excellent resources coming out, a wonderful series of interviews with ABE and ESL teachers across the state, um, a nice series focused on um, building effective packets for people who are uh, not able to do um, technology-based instruction right now, updates information from the distance learning support team. So um, check that out. You can go back and on the Atlas website and review the archived newsletters as well. And I see that Amber mentions in the chat, there's a great webinar today coming out of that links group. Yes, there's a um, webinar, Voices from the Field, again, about the transitions to distance education. Um, at three o'clock today, and I posted some information about that on the Schoology group if you want to get registered for that. Um, we have been getting some questions about um, licensure and relicensure. Wanted to make sure that everybody knew about the Pelsby COVID-19 updates and FAQs website. So that's um, a link that you might want to bookmark and check back frequently. Um, the most recent FAQ was posted back on April 8th. Um, and as of that time, um, they stated that in terms of renewal um, deadlines, um, Pelsby is currently working with state legislators around um, the required training. So that is the information that I have at this point. I encourage you to check back 
um, for continued updates from Pelsby. Um, and if anyone has any additional information to share with the group, we encourage you to put that in the chat. And I think at this point, we'll move on to some questions, right, Brad? Yeah, thank you so much, Astrid, for keeping us informed, keeping us uh, prepared for uh, and trained to uh, conduct all these innovations or create these innovations, and for keeping us connected with one another so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel um, each in our own programs and in our own homes. So thank you so much, Astrid, and for all of our professional development folks, for our, ent our entire AB support network. Thank you for all of your hard work during this time to support the field. Okay. Like Astrid said, we're now going to open it up for questions. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to click to raise your hand and we can unmute you or call on you. We also, um, you can also type in your question and we will be happy to address it. Uh, again, we'll, uh, we have some time. I know there's a lot of content covered today, so you might have several different questions. And thank you for, uh, to, thank you for holding your questions until now. So Brad, I wonder, we did have quite a few questions in our distance learning section. Um, so as we go back and look at, at what some of the other questions were, I wonder if, um, Susan, you wanna speak to that a little bit. It looks like maybe some clarification is needed around um, time on task versus unit completion, um, question about um, Schoology and its ability to track time on task. Um, can you speak a little bit to some of those questions that have come in on the chat? I will try, although I have to say I'm not a Schoology expert, so I'm not entirely certain what all mechanisms are in that learning management system for counting things. Um, so I think it really is up to um, the individual teacher who's building the course to know the system they're using and what it is um, capable of and what it's not capable of and submit an application for the course in the way that best describes how they want to count hours. So for example, I know um, through working with Amber on her course at the community college, they have um, D2L and she showed screenshots of how she can see time. So we know that that system can count um, time on task. So that would make sense for her to go through a time on task application. But if you have a different system that maybe only counts time on task for quizzes, for example, or something, and all the other work it doesn't count the time on task for, that's probably not gonna be a good fit for you. So you'd probably want to do a unit completion process instead. And when you wanna do unit completion, you want to have a rationale for why the amount of time makes sense that you're allocating. So I have a video and the video is 15 minutes long and I have this text and based on my knowledge of what the students are capable of, it should take them so and so long to read that. And then they have this interactive activity and they have to do a writing exercise and I expect that should take 20 minutes. And you kind of add it all up and you say, okay, the units are approximately this long, right? And you should also have some students go through it and um, and see how long it actually takes them to the, the best extent you can do and use that to inform what um, your unit completion rate is. And that's the same process that we already have in place for unit completion for um, uh, purchased curricula or or um, existing distance learning platforms. Like the, the process really isn't any different. The, issue is just I'm um, organizing and building the, the content myself as opposed to a publisher doing it, right? Otherwise, the, the procedure is pretty much the same as what we've always done. Great. Does that Thanks. Some questions? <laughs> so so um, if people have additional questions that were not addressed um, by Susan's additional explanation here, um, can you please put them back in the chat and we will come back to you. Um, thank you, Susan. So. Um, Couple of other questions uh, related to, to policy and contact hours. Um, does the change to the 12 hour rule also include current students who do not have a valid or current test? And I can answer that. So the answer to that one is yes. Uh, the exemption to the 12 hour rule restriction, um, 12 hour restriction applies for any new student or any current student that does not have a valid pretest. Great, thanks, Brad. Um, 
looks like we have a question. Um, Jody, would you please give us the dates for the 2020 ABE fiscal year for ours again, please? Um, see that question? I, I have to admit, I'm not quite sure what the question is. Um, but so the 2020 fiscal year is the year that we're currently in, and that fiscal year ends on June 30th. Starting on July 1st, we start a new fiscal year, um, which is fiscal year 21. I wonder if the question is um, the dates that for the, the contact hour reporting period that we will use to determine fiscal year 2021 funding. If that's the question, the answer is March 14th, 2019, <clears throat> excuse me, to March 13th, 2020. If that's not the question, maybe Kathy, you can um, chat in to clarify what it is that you're asking for. The other thing that might be helpful to note here, um, Jody, it looks like we had a typo on our slide. So the contact hours that were used to determine fiscal year 2020 funding, um, the current, the fiscal year that we're currently in, it was actually May 1st, 2018 to April 30th. 2019. I think it was listed accidentally as uh, April um, 1st to May 30th. Right. Yes. I think you're right about that, Brad. So that was a mistake on my part. So, Kathy, let us know if that didn't answer your question. And then, uh, Susan and Tom, if you want to speak a little bit more to, to future plans, we have a question for Margaret. Would an application be considered that is not on a learning management system for distance learning approval? Tom, do you want me to take that one or do you want to answer? <laughs> right. So existing DL policy, even prior to this whole closure and everything changing, never required that distance learning be done online. There were, in fact, paper-based and video-based curricula that had been approved and um, and could be used previously, right? So there's no requirement that the platform that you apply for has to be an online platform. If you have a, a curriculum that you have purchased and you think um, you can uh, make a good solid case for um, its standards alignment and it's it has instruction content in it because that is a requirement of DL policy. It has to instruct, it can't just be practice, right? So there's instruction, it's standards aligned. I can make um, a case for why the unit um, allocation that I'm assigning is um, reasonable. You could go through the existing application process um, that has always been there for years, right? So um, I think we've we've moved in the direction of of doing all our DL online um, in the recent years, but that's never been a requirement. So um, I think if if you're in a correctional facility, for example, and internet access just isn't an option, then maybe a, a paper or some other um, asynchronous method is is going to be what your option is, right? So um, you could apply for those through that existing process. Tom, do you have anything you want to add to that? Uh, no, just a, just a general comment, not specifically about that, but you know, just in general, I'd, I'd like everyone to know that the t our team is working very hard with the state staff to develop policies and procedures to deal with really unprecedented situations. And we understand this is a very rapidly evolving time. So we may not come up with the perfect final answer every time, but we really are trying to balance state and federal requirements, the needs of our learners, the capacities of programs, and solid instructional uh, standards and practices in a time that none of us have ever been through before. So I, I guess I would just put a plea out there for mutual patience as we work through a lot of these situations that are coming up now. Thank you, Tom and Susan, and, and thank you both, and thanks to the entire DL team. Um, I'll reiterate that they have been working tirelessly to try to answer all of your questions and um, make solid recommendations. So we're very appreciative to have a team of experts uh, guiding us through this time. Um, we have another question, maybe most appropriate for the whole group, if people want to chat in their thoughts. To Susan. Um, my home internet is very fragile even after they have rebooted the router. Is there any place I can go if my school is closed to teach? So maybe people can chime in on the chat. Uh, 
If people have other questions that have not yet been answered, um, just to ask you to please put them in the chat to bump them to the to the end where we can see them. So Astrid, it looks like um, Heather has shared that, um, you know, some places that could be a coffee shop in the neighborhood that has public Wi-Fi nearby where you could be outside um, in the parking lot and use the Wi-Fi there. I do, do also know that some teachers have been using uh, their school district's Wi-Fi, so they've been going to their school um, and logging into the internet from the parking lot there, if that is a possibility. Great. I'd encourage people to continue chatting in some questions and ideas, but I do, will, do want to keep an eye on the time. I know it's 1130 right now, so we'll continue to answer questions, but we want to say thank you all very much for all of your hard work, for your persistence, for your dedication, um, and for some of the amazing work that you've been doing during this time. We will have resources from this webinar and earlier communications online at mnabe.org. Um, so stay tuned. We'll post the recording there, hopefully later today or tomorrow. Um, and anything else that you'd like to add, um, Astrid or anyone else on our uh, adult education team? Hey, Brad, just a quick suggestion. There's a, a number of comments about um, the need for hotspots. If people have um, ABE funds that they think will be unspent by the end of the year, they might consider um, using some of those funds to purchase hotspots with. I will just warn everybody that they're really hard to come by right now. I know from my colleagues in K-12 um, who have been trying to do device distributions for K-12 students that um, many are being told that hotspots are on back order. So um, yeah, you you can try, <laughs> but you might have to place the order now and get them um, when they're available again. That's good to know. Been to say that that may though even if they're on back order if you incur the expense now that may be a good way to build some capacity for the future it doesn't solve short-term right. problems but it would you be a way the to money use up to get them in july when they're available right <laughs> exactly. so good idea comment. but just be aware yeah they're probably not going to come very soon yes carla i think we can stop recording now thank you all very much